Good morning, church. How we doing? What's up? Y'all look good? You feel good? All right. Yeah, I got some gentle nods. That's good. That's good. Um, my name's Austin. If we haven't met yet, I'd love to meet you at some point. Say hey, give you a high five. But uh, we have been in this series all summer through the gospel according to Mark. And over these last few weeks, uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at really the last couple weeks of Jesus' life, looking at how uh, the last couple weeks where we've been is that Jesus was our ransom. Jesus paid uh, the ransom that was due for the sin that we had accrued personally, but he paid it in full. Amen? And so we could just sing these songs like, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, because Jesus has paid the debt entirely. The bill has been paid. There's nothing else that we can add to it at this point. If there was still sin that we could add to it, the grave would still be occupied. But the grave is empty, knowing that we know that the payment has been made in full and it's done. Last week, then what we talked about was that Jesus didn't just come to usher in this kind of new age of religion, but what he came to bring was spiritual renewal. We talked about spiritual hypocrisy and how uh, we don't want to be in this situation where our life looks good on the outside, where we're kind of all leaves, if you will, but no fruit on the branches. But what Jesus intends to do through us, giving our faith to him, is to actually recreate his fruitfulness inside of us so that we're not just putting on a show for the world to see, but we're actually being transformed from the inside out, right? This week, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about the idea of rejection. Rejection. And what we're going to look at is how I would make the argument, Jesus, I believe, was the most rejected human being that's ever walked the planet. He has walked through and been through, endured more rejection than probably you and I ever will. And yet he overcame that rejection. He walked all the way through it. I think so that we would know we're not alone in it because I know a lot of people even walking in here right now, you hear that topic for a morning and you go, well, this isn't gonna be fun. Let's talk about rejection, you know? And it, you know, for me, it make, brings back some memories from, from middle school. I tried the high jump one time, you know, tall and skinny and track coach looked at me and he was like, high jump, bro. I gave it one try, one try. I, I saw the guys do it and I was like, okay, you just kind of run around on the side and then you just, you just hop over the thing, right? And I, I did it one time and I came up on my approach and I didn't know what I was doing. I think I jumped off the wrong foot and I landed on the bar, basically missed the mat. And he was like, you should never do that again. <laughs> and I never did. I probably would have been a decent high jumper if he would have just coached me a little bit, but that rejection impeded me from ever doing it ever again. And, and that's, that's silly. I mean, you think about, Right, I mean, the dreaded uh, schoolyard pick of captains and who was gonna be the last one to be chosen. And even though you got picked, somehow you still felt rejected, right? And I mean, that's, that's silly, but we can go through all different levels of rejection. Kids who have rejected their parents, parents who you have perpetuated this feeling in generations where you've, you've done things and maybe you've even apologized, but you've created this feeling of rejection towards your kids. Rejection from a spouse, rejection from a job. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And what we're going to hopefully do today is not just wade into this topic just to bring it up and point it out, but hopefully to find some freedom from it today. And so we're going to look at first how, how Jesus endured so many different kinds of rejection. So we're going to go throughout Mark in a few different places, but we'll start with Mark 8, 31. If you have your Bible, you can open it up and we're gonna flip around through Mark and it's gonna be on the screen if you don't have it with you. Mark 8, 31 says, and he, Jesus, began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be, say that word, rejected rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. If you remember, as we've been going out through the story following Jesus, what we've seen is that Jesus is continually telling his disciples, telling his followers that he's going to be put to death. And his disciples have a hard time grasping it because they can't really reconcile what their picture of the kingdom was and what Jesus' actual bringing of the kingdom meant. And so as Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die, they would say, "That, that can't be the right answer. But what Jesus says, he's like, no, it's not just going to be that I die on a cross, but I'm going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests. And so the first area that Jesus felt rejection was from his very own Jewish culture. The the leaders and and the pillars of, of of the culture that he was born into, a part of, rejected him. Psalm 118 predicts this. It says, Psalm 118, 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So you think about the builders and, and all of these religious leaders of the day, um, they, they have rejected all of what it was meant to point to, which was Jesus, this person. It was pointing to Jesus and they, and they reject him by, by putting him to death on the cross, by, by beating him, by torturing him. And so 
His very own culture betrays him. Acts 4, 11, after Jesus has resurrected and ascended, it says that it calls back to this Psalm. This Jesus is the stone. This is Peter kind of bringing it all full circle for us. He's bringing all the pieces together. He's like, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. Rejected by you, the builders, you, the, the priests, you, the, the, the leaders of the religious area of this culture right now. You've rejected him and he has now become the cornerstone and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's like, it's not that you just got rid of this one little piece of the puzzle. You got rid of the piece. You've rejected the one piece that without it, the rest of the building just doesn't hold up. You've rejected Jesus. And, and I think we know how this feels as Christians in America in 2022. That maybe even some of you sitting in this room, you remember a time where Christianity was actually the focal point. It was the centerpiece of our culture. And I think, I think oftentimes we look back on that with an extra romanticized eye. Like, well, back, you know, in the 50s and 60s, everybody just went to church and that's what we all did. And we could say, well, yeah, but were they, were they just a bunch of people who were all leaves and no fruit like last week? Or was there actual transformation happening in people? I don't know. But what I do know is that we have moved on to a post-Christian culture. Where, by and large, where you go, what you do, uh, like Christianity has now moved off of the normal center standing point of the rest of culture. It hasn't always been this way. I was talking to a friend who's in a college class right now. And he's like, I, I'm sitting there getting my orientation for my class. And I'm the only person who's not putting uh, pronouns in my bio. I'm the only person who's not. And it's just, this, it's this proof that everything around us is just shifting and it's moving and it's tilting off the axis that, that maybe it once did uh, orient itself around a little better where culture used to be way more accepting and way more normative around Christianity we've now moved off into this place where we as Christians, I, th I think, feel a bit rejected by the world around us. We do. We recognize that, uh, and maybe we were never the cool people to begin with. We, we could acknowledge that, right? I mean, that's, that's okay. I don't think we're here to be cool. We're here to be holy, yeah? But, but I think we've lost a little relevance. We've lost a little bit of the attention. We've lost a little bit of the influence. And we feel that. We feel that rejection, even the way it affects the way we gather on Sunday mornings, where we know not everybody else in the world is doing this right now. Not everybody else in our world is doing this right now. Amen? So Jesus faced rejection from the culture, and we face rejection from the culture, but Jesus also faced rejection from the crowds. So Mark 15. Now we're back into the story where we've been the last couple weeks, where we're now in the last week of Jesus' life. It says, now at the feast... Now at the feast, there's this custom, there's this tradition at the Passover that the high priest would get to excuse one criminal. One criminal would be brought in and he would get to pardon them from the punishment that they were due. And so at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked, the crowds that had gathered. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man named Barabbas. There's a man named Barabbas. He was a murderer. He'd led an insurrection. So he'd led a rebellion against the establishment. He, would, he, was, he was stirring things up. He was caught. He was put in prison. He was guilty. He was guilty. And, and at this time, the, the, the priest gets to pardon somebody. And so they have Barabbas here in the crowd. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Mind you, he has Jesus right here. And he says, do you want me to release him? He's innocent. As far as I'm concerned, there, there's no blood on this man's hands. He has done nothing wrong. And yet you are, you are thirsty for blood right now to kill him. And so we, we, they come to this moment of the feast and they're saying, okay, now we get to release somebody. I have, this, I have this guilty murderer and I have this innocent person. Do you want me to release him, the innocent one? And what do they say? For he perceived that it was, all, it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered Jesus up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. They release Barabbas. They're crying out, release Barabbas. What do they, they chant out to Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him, kill him, put him to death, release for us Barabbas. And the weight, if you could have been there in the moment to be Jesus, to have this whole crowd that you know you, you didn't come to be served by them, but you came to serve them and give your life as a ransom for many, as we already read in Mark. He's here to give his life for them, to serve them, to bless them. And they cry out, kill him, put him to death, kill him, release for us the murderer instead. 
he felt the rejection of the crowds. Many of you feel rejected by the crowds. Maybe it's at your school. You're, you're a Christian. You're going into a school place right now. And, and, and I think intuitively we know I could be the person that prays with other people at school, but we don't. Why? Because we fear rejection from the crowds. At your workplace, uh, not all of you work in a church. Not all of you work in a setting where everyone else is a Christian. Maybe some of you do. Praise God for that. But a lot of you, praise God for this, work in places where you're not surrounded by Christians. Do you speak up with the gospel? Do you pray for people? Do you offer to serve people? My guess is we don't always, and maybe we don't even do it often because we're afraid of the rejection of the crowds. We're afraid of praying for our team as we're getting ready to start a sporting event because we don't want our team to think of us differently. We don't want our team to ostracize us or kick us out of the circle, right? And so we fear, we have this rejection of the crowds that we face as well. So Jesus faces he faces rejection from the culture, from the crowds, but he also faces rejection from those who are close to him. Mark 14, 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and she saw Peter warming himself. And she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. And Peter denies it. You see, we're familiar with this story. We've read it several times. Jesus has literally, literally, he told Peter what was going to happen. You are going to reject me. You are going to deny me before men. Peter's like, nah, bro, I got you, right? Like he's all bold in the moment with Jesus. And then you just get him alone by himself for a second with a servant girl. Is she intimidating? Is she a threat? No. And, and we read this story. I think we read it sometimes like, like they weren't, they, they were in the same courtyard, like we read it like it happened in two different zones and two different areas, like they couldn't see each other. But in one, in one of the stories in the gospel, it says that Jesus made eye contact with him. They could see each other. They were in the room together. He sa she says to him, you're, you're one of the Nazarene people with Jesus. He denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. He pretends there's like this language barrier. It's like, huh, como se dice? No habla espanol, you know? And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him. It should have been the sign for Peter, right? Because he knew that's what was going to happen. It should have been the sign. Oh yeah, Jesus, oh yeah, Jesus said, but, but the story continues. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystander, this man is one of them. But again, Peter denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly, no, like I know it. You absolutely are. You are one of them for you are a Galilean but he began to invoke a curse on himself. Remember that next week when we talk about redemption. He invoked a curse on himself. It was his own volition. He decided to say this and he swore, I do not know this man whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. He wept bitterly. So Jesus has experienced it from the culture. He's experienced the rejection from the crowds, but he's also experienced rejection from those who were closest to him. Peter was one of his closest friends, one of the closest people he was with in his time in ministry on earth. And Peter, in a moment, to a slave girl at first and to others at second, says, I have nothing to do with that man. Peter, Peter and Jesus make eye contact after the rooster crows for the, for the second time. And he breaks down and he weeps because he knows that he's just rejected the son of God who he spent the last few years of his life following. And some of you feel that level of rejection. It's not just the silly story from the high school team that didn't pick you or whatever, but you've experienced rejection from those who are closest to you. From a spouse who's no longer your spouse anymore. From a kid who you gave everything and they walked away from it. Maybe you were the kid and all you ever wanted was for dad to show up. I just want him to be at a game. I just want him to be where he says that he's gonna be. And he never came and you faced and you felt and you experienced rejection. Maybe it was, a, there was a person in a position of trust. You go, no, this person would always take care of me. They'd always have my best interest in mind. And they blew it. They abandoned you. They, they left you high and dry in a moment when you needed them most. See, it's one thing to experience it from the culture. I can deal with the culture at large. I really don't care what they have to say. I've got my people right here. We're good, aren't we? It's one thing, it's one thing if the crowds want to say something about me, but if I've got my close people that, that know me and they're on my side, I'm good to go wherever. But as soon as, you know, we know, don't we? As soon as those people that are meant to be in your corner 
start laying you by the wayside and rejecting you, this is one of the ones that hurts the most, isn't it? And it's not, it didn't just stop there. Jesus didn't just experience it from the culture, the crowds, and those closest to him. He also felt rejected by God himself, by the Father. It says, Mark 15, 33, it says, And when the sixth hour had come, Jesus was there, nailed to the cross, dying. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I'm not here to say that God had actually abandoned Jesus, but he felt it. He felt as if God had left him. Where he's crying, this, this God, the father who Jesus had spent eternity in perfect union with him, even as we see his ministry going about the day to day, Jesus often would withdraw and he would pray because he's, he's so prioritized communion with the father. He so prioritized this relationship with God so that he would only execute whatever will God, the father had for him on the earth. That's what Jesus wanted to do. God direct my steps. He wants to do whatever he has for him to do. And in a moment here, he's hanging on the cross. He's dying. He's gasping for his very last breaths. And he says, God, why have you left me? Where are you? Where are you? And some of you have felt that way. Like if you can be this honest, and even in church this morning, you have come to moments in your life where you feel like God himself isn't listening, where God himself made a bad plan when he put you in this situation years ago, and now you're reaping the fruits of it. You feel like you have been, you have been abandoned by God the Father. And, you, and you, you just cry out prayers. You wish you could cry out the kind of authentic prayers that David would cry, cry where he goes, God, like, where have you gone? My soul is aching just to hear your voice, just to know what you want for me to do. I long to be with you, God, and you're so far removed from this situation right now. Have you felt that before? Yes. So is Jesus. If love is one of our greatest needs as human beings, then it makes sense that rejection is one of our deepest fears because it's the inability to actually feel loved by people when they're rejecting you. God has not forsaken you. He has not left you and he has not abandoned you. You may be going through a trial right now. You may go, be going through a desert season right now, but I promise you that God has not left you. God did not leave Jesus. God did not abandon him. He picked him up out of the grave, but he, he let him go to fulfill exactly what it was that he was meant to accomplish. And so maybe your desert season right now, maybe your wandering heart that is crying out going, God, where are you in my life? Maybe he has something for you just on the other side. And your obedience in the dry season, I believe is so much more valuable and precious than our obedience in the times when all the things are going right. My, my urge to you, the devil would love to have you stop right now. Keep going, keep going. Don't stop, keep pushing forward. You're not alone. The devil would love to isolate you in your sense of rejection, make you feel like you're the only person going through what you're going through right now. And I, how many of you, as I'm going through that list right now, you're like, I I've experienced, not, no, I'm not talking about like, um, you know, that kid's awkward and so I didn't say yes to go to the dance with them, okay? Like that, I, that's me, that, or I'm, I'm saying that's real, okay? It happens. But how many of you have like deep level of rejection? Just raise your hand right now. Come on, look at the room. Look at the, no, keep them up, keep them up for a second. Look around. You are not alone. You are not alone. And if nobody else on earth knows exactly what you're going through, Jesus does because he went through it himself. Jesus has faced what you're facing today. So here's where the message turns because there, every single person in this room has experienced rejection before, but some of you have embraced a spirit of rejection. If we could say it that way, like it's, it's one thing to, it, it's one thing to experience it from time and time again from the coworker, from the spouse, from the kids, from, from this, whatever. It's one thing to experience rejection. It's another thing to anticipate it at every turn. It's another thing to let rejection demand where your steps are gonna go because you are so afraid of one day being rejected that you fail to do different things. How, how many of you know, if you've embraced a spirit, a posture of rejection, you are failing to connect with certain people because you're just saying, oh, well, if I connect, then they're just gonna reject me at a different point. Uh, I'm not going to do this thing. I'm not going to exert my effort here because I know that if I try, somebody can reject me. But if I don't try, nobody can reject me because I didn't give my full effort. There are so many different ways that we can identify. There, there's this disorder that is called rejection-sensitive dysphoria. Rejection-sensitive dysphoria. What it means is you have an unbelievably hard time 
tolerating even the thought of rejection. And that didn't come from anywhere. That came specifically from somewhere. Some wound, some time, some experience, something someone did to you. And you have just embraced this posture now of rejection that you're anticipating it at every turn. I talked to a friend recently, young guy, um, came home from work one day, busy season of life, married um, just a couple years into his marriage. He knew that life was a little chaotic, but I don't think he understood how chaotic it was because he came home one day to find the bags packed from his wife. And she said, I, listen, I, I'm not making any rash decisions right now. I just, I need some space. I need to get, I need to get out of here for a little bit. I just need some time to think. And it broke his heart. Why, why was he not the person that she would confide that thing into? Why all of a sudden is it me that she needs space from? Nonetheless, she, she packed her bags, she moved out, she left. His only response that he knew how to do was go up to Estes Park. He's like, I just, I need to go and I just need to pray. That's all I know how to do. I don't know what I'm gonna pray. I don't know what, I don't know what my prayers are gonna look like. They're not gonna be real polished. They're not gonna be real clean. I, I just don't have any other response. How many of you felt that way before? He goes up there, he starts praying. He feels like God so clearly speaks to him in that moment. He's like, hey, listen, you have two choices. You can choose to do the things that make you feel good in moments so that you kind of forget about what's happening here. You could drink, you could party, you could go hang out with friends. You can find new girls to sleep around with. You can do any list of these other things over there. And they're gonna make you feel good for about a day, maybe for a week, maybe even for a whole season, you'll feel okay. But what's at the end of that road? I feel like God just showed him. What's at the end of that road? This feeling over and over and over and over again. Then, God's, then God showed him, or we can be free from this. You can accept the fact that it was not your identity that was placed in marriage that made you valuable, that made you lovable. It was my love for you. It was my calling that I had in your life. And so you can move from this and you can walk in freedom. And he says in that moment, it was clear, I, I chose this one. Now, that, does that mean that his road didn't have ups and downs from there? Listen, you, you go through that list. He, he was fearful of rejection from the culture. What, he, what's it like to go to church every day when you're a divorced 22 year old? What does that mean? What is it, how is my family? How is my small group? How are my friends? How are they gonna treat me since I'm going through this right now? He was experiencing the rejection at all these different levels that we're talking about. Those closest to him, he was afraid. He was rejected by the person who, whom, whom he pledged to love for the rest of his life and she pledged the same. And she just bailed on him. And he said, in, in, in my darkest moments, I was like, God, you suck. You, why even have me marry her in the first place if you knew this is where I was gonna be? And now, this is his words, not mine. He's like, and now I have a testimony that my God is still good, that my God still loves, that my God still has plans for me, even though this happened to me. And that's what God wants you to hear this morning too. Nobody can take, nobody can take your value from you and nobody can take your identity from you. If someone came up to me and were like, hey, uh, your kids, they don't have any value. I would say, who are you to define how much I love my kids? If they were saying, hey, the, you know, the, these kids, they are, they are unlovable. I would say, whatever, those are my kids. I love them. God defines his love for you. He defines your value. Other people do not. And the freedom that you can have today for some of you who have gone so far as not just to experience rejection, but to adopt now this posture of rejection, that it's keeping you from all these different things that God has for you in your life because you are just so afraid of being hurt again. I think God wants to give you freedom this morning. Because if, if we just look through, oh, let's look at this definition real quick. Henry Wright, who, uh, author of a couple books, says this about rejection. He defines it this way. Rejection, he says, is a form of unbelief. It is as dangerous as unbelief itself, as dangerous as faithlessness. Rejection is a form of unbelief because rejection says you are not accepted by God. And in order to be accepted of God, you first must be accepted by men. And it sets man as your God. So it is as dangerous as unbelief. But the message here this morning is clear. Psalm 139, 13 through 15. God, you formed my inward parts. Everyone should read this in the first person. God, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No matter what that person said, no matter what that person did, no matter how, what that person drug me through, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Ephesians says you are, you are Christ's workmanship. You're like his poetry. He stitched you together piece by piece on purpose, knowing exactly the kind of value that was going to be in you. Don't let somebody else rob that from you. He's woven you together. He says, my, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast the sum of God's thoughts for you. How vast? If I could count them, they are more than the sand. They are more than the sand. I thought about bringing just like a jar of sand up here on the stage. I thought otherwise, because I thought it'd give too many of you anxiety this morning. You wouldn't be able to focus. <laughs> I don't know, like if I had a jar or so, you know, full of sand, how many grains of sand do you think that would be? Well, a few hundred thousand, maybe. I don't know. If I just started pouring, this is where I would lose all of you, right? <laughs> I just started pour, let's say I covered this stage in sand. Caden, he'd kill me, right? You know? <laughs> I don't know. How many grains of sand do you think fit on this stage? A million? This, is like, this isn't even no beach we're talking about right here. Even Boyd Lake Swim Beach has more sand than that. <laughs> What's the point of this psalm? God never stops thinking about you. He never stops thinking about you. Before you began, before the earth was made, before anything ever happened, God was thinking about you. He was delighting in you. Romans 8, 15, let's just punch through a couple of these verses. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Nobody can take that from you. Nobody can take that from you. If you've been rejected by this person, that person, nobody can rob you of your adoption by God himself brought you into his family. That's how much he loves you. Sons, daughters are who sit in front of me today. First John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna tolerate moving around with the fear of being rejected. We're not gonna tolerate letting all of this fear about what might happen keep me from doing what God wants me to do right now continually operating in love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love instead. Perfect love from God the Father casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Second Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear. Not of fear. If you have fear, that's not from him. He didn't give you a spirit of fear. He didn't want you to be all sheltered up, swallowed up, so stifled by what might happen in the world that you can't do anything. No, he hasn't given you that spirit, but he's given you a spirit of confident power and love and self-control. This is what God wants from us. Ephesians 2, 18. We talked about this at the group mixer last week. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You feel like you don't belong in church. You feel like you don't belong to a family. Welcome home. Welcome home. Like you, you belong here. There is no, I mean, Katie just read it, right? We're not gonna boast in anything in this room except for Christ. So maybe my rejection hasn't looked like your rejection. Maybe your rejection's been terrible. You know what you need? You need a family. You need a family. You need someone, you need some people in your corner who are gonna see the flaws in your life and they're still gonna love you. They're still gonna show up for you. You need to keep reminding yourself of Psalm 139. No, God, no, God has had a plan for me long before any of this junk ever happened in my life. And that plan is for good. He keeps thinking good things. He formed me on purpose. He made me on purpose. He brought me to this moment on purpose. And, and he's not going to leave me now because look at where he's brought me from. He's not going to leave me here. The other thing that I think we can do is the opportunity to just repent from and renounce the agreement that we've had in our mind from just continually defaulting to rejection. So we're going to move to a time of communion. But before we jump right into it. I just want to create a space and an opportunity here for you to just repent and to just turn away from this, this posture that you've assumed, thinking that everyone's just going to keep rejecting you. So if everyone could just, around the room, if we could just kind of close our eyes. And if this is really, if it's landing for you, I, I would just posture yourself to be expected that you would receive right now. Put your hands out in front of you. Put your hands up, whatever you need to do. And we just cry out, Father, 
we come to you in the name of Jesus. By his blood, we have confidence to call out to you in this moment. God, we recognize where we have agreed with and we take responsibility for the places where we have, where we have accepted the rejection that's happened from us as our primary identity. And we've made, we've made rejection our primary operating system. We recognize where that's happened and we take responsibility for it. And not just in our own life, but in the generations before us. Maybe dad did something to us and his dad did something to him and his dad did something to him. And I pray right now that the generational curse that is falling on people would cease in Jesus' name. So we take responsibility for all of these things that have happened in our past, in our own life, and we renounce serving it. We're not gonna serve that master anymore. God, we ask you for forgiveness and we receive it this morning because you have promised it to us. You have promised forgiveness. And God, we thank you for delivering us from this line of thinking. Jesus, we just, we cast all of that agreement out and we just acknowledge that we have been ransomed. The payment has been made and we receive the spirit of adoption this morning by which we cry out, Abba, Father. God, you have forgiven us. You have cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. You have given us a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind, God. We don't want to operate out of rejection anymore. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you fill us up? Would you empower us this morning to continually remind our hearts of the things that you've already declared to be true? Jesus, we come before you desperate this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. During worship, I was just kind of thinking of this verse out of Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also... Sorry, let me set it up a little more. Hebrews 11 is talking about all these legendary pillars of the faith and all of these amazing things they did and all the people who suffered and all the people who had been through it and all the people who had done these amazing, marvelous things. And the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, your, your family, by the way, is not just the people in this room. It's the saints of history that are looking into this moment, just longing for a breakthrough in your life. They said, let us also lay aside every weight. Dump the weight of rejection this morning. Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set out before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, despising the rejection, but for the joy set before him, he just kept on going towards the cross. Why? So he can have this moment with you right now. You want to know what led Jesus through all the different rejection that he faced? It was his fixation on this moment with you. And I just want you to believe it this morning. You've been rejected time and time again. You've had people let you down over and over again. But this moment when we come to the communion table and we receive the fact that, no, he made a way, not just so that we could look back and remember him, but so that we could encounter his presence right now. So that you can encounter his love right now, his peace right now, the hope that should be found in him right now. So would you, would you stand with me? Hopefully you grabbed one of these on your way in. If you don't have one, just put your hand in the air. Mike Cloud's standing right there and he'll just hum it across the room right into your hand. Dude's got an arm like a shortstop, I've heard. So just test it out. Throw your hand up if you don't have one. Let's see. give it just a sec. I just broke the rule. I opened the juice first. Don't do that. It'll spill. You kind of got to do something like this. I did it last week, right? No, last time. Five second rule in heaven. Praise the Lord. Okay. Take your bread. Take your bread. Jesus, we receive your body now, knowing that you, this was a joyful sacrifice on your end. You, you did this so that you could be with us right now. And so I pray in this room, would people experience your love? Would they experience the love of the Father right now? 
that God, you so delight in them, you so think about them, you so want to be with them. I pray that we'd put our past behind us. And I'm not saying it won't hurt anymore, that it won't have moments where it stings, but would our primary default understanding be your love? And so with that thought in mind, we receive your body now together. And God, we take the cup, knowing that this represents your blood. By your stripes, we are healed. By the blood of Jesus, we can come and we can ask for healing from the wounds that have been inflicted on us by another. And so for all the hurting hearts in this room right now, all the aches and the pains, God, would you bring your grace in like a healing balm in this moment? Would you take open wounds and would you make them healed scars so we might have a testimony to share about the good things you've done? We receive your grace now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for today. I know this is a lot. It's a lot to go through. It's a lot to journey into emotionally. But by the power of your spirit, we can walk out of here and we can begin to experience the life transformation that you have for us. We can step out of this room experiencing your new life this morning, God. And so I pray that as we leave here, would we not make decisions counting on people to fail us, but would we make decisions knowing that you never will? You will always be by our side. So whether we're going to work or whether we're going to the soccer field or whether we're going back to um, the office or the school, wherever it is, God, would you be with us and would your presence alone sustain us? It's in Jesus' name we pray. The church said, amen. amen.